can start to look at your mind, you begin to realize it's like having a whole committee in there. Lots of different opinions, lots of different agendas. You see this especially when you're trying to get the mind to settle down. One part of the mind decides to focus on the breath, but it seems like there are other parts of the mind that want to go in other places, don't want to be bothered. So in the beginning it's a question of learning how to strengthen the side of the mind that wants to stay. You can do this in lots of different ways. One, reminding yourself why you're here. Remind yourself of all the good things that can come through staying with the breath. You develop mindfulness, you develop concentration, the mind gets a sense of peace inside when the concentration gets strong. You de develop alertness. You begin to see your own actions a lot more clearly. This is important. In fact, it's so important that the Buddha's last words were about heedfulness. Watch out, he said. When you practice, you have to be careful. You have to be heedful. You can't be complacent. This is because your actions are important. Think about it. The Buddha could have said a few last words about nirvana or emptiness. But instead he focused on heedfulness, the principle that your actions are important and you have to be careful about what you do because the actions can go in all sorts of different directions. They have results. And so as you meditate, you remind yourself of that fact, that what you're doing here is learning to be a lot more clear about what's going on in your mind. The more steadily you can stay with the breath, the more consistently, the more you see in terms of all the subtle politics going on in the mind. The part of the mind that wants to be heedful and the part of the mind that doesn't, or parts of the mind. It's like there are many different voices in there, not just two. So when you settle down to be with the breath, be prepared. There could be lots of other voices, voices pulling in different directions, and it's normal. Don't get discouraged. Try to strengthen the good voices by making the breath comfortable. So there's an immediately felt sense of ease, sense of well-being that comes just by sitting here breathing. Feels good to breathe in, feels good to breathe out. You don't have to force the breath, you don't have to hold it in, you don't have to count. Let the breath come in and out at whatever rhythm feels good for the body. If the rhythm keeps changing, fine, as long as it feels good. Be on top of each breath. Make sure that it feels right for the body coming in and going out. And you find as you do this, you get more and more sensitive, so that you get more and more precise in doing this. The more precise and sensitive you are, the more absorbing the breath becomes and the easier to come it is to stay here. So that this mindful alert part of the mind, or the mindful alert faction of the mind, gets stronger. It doesn't get kicked out so easily. Ordinarily when greed, anger, and delusion take over the mind, they kick out the mindfulness and alertness. They don't want anybody around watching. It's like politicians when they're discussing a corrupt deal. They don't want journalists in there. They don't want anybody to see what they're doing. You notice this. when. This part of the mind wants to do something unskillful, something it knows it shouldn't be doing. They're trying to kick out your alertness, kick out your mindfulness. doesn't want to hear what they have to say. And that's how it can go ahead and do those things. But if mindfulness and alertness de develop a strong hold here in the present moment, hanging on to the breath, the breath feels good, the breath is clear in different parts of the body. Wherever you can sense the breath, focus on that, and then get the, let the different parts of the breathing sensations connect so it feels good. This gives mindfulness and alertness a really good, solid place to settle in. And 
And then this way you can turn the fact that your mind is a committee to your advantage. In other words, when greed, anger, and delusion threaten to take over the mind, they don't get the whole mind. You still have that faction of the committee that says, no, don't want to go there because I know better. This is called having a sense of shame, a sense of the fear of the consequences of evil. Ordinarily, we don't like to hear about the word shame. And it's important that we understand what the Buddha meant by shame. It's not being ashamed of yourself. It's being ashamed of the idea of doing something you know that you shouldn't do. You feel that it's beneath you. In this sense, shame is not a sense of low self-esteem. It's, it's the counterpart to high self-esteem. You know better to do it than to do those things. You're not the kind of person who wants to do those things. And so when you have mindfulness and alertness on your side, that sense of shame becomes an important protector of the mind, a protector of your future. The same with the quality of the fear of the consequences of doing evil. That's a kind of fear that's skillful, that's useful. Because the unskillful part of the mind says, I don't care what the long-term consequences are. I want pleasure right now. I want to make my profits right now and then run. But if you are the consequences of the evil, looks to the future and say, I don't want to, I don't want to go there. No matter how much fun this may be right in the present moment, this is not where I want to go. So when mindfulness and alertness have developed this beachhead here in the present moment, right here with the breath, stay right there, then these qualities of shame and fear of the consequences of evil come and help. Strengthen your heedfulness, strengthen your lack of complacency, strengthen the, the good side of the mind, the, the good members of the committee. It gives them a place where they can all band together and work together. The problem is in the past the good members of the committee have been all separated. When they've been separated, they don't work together. They get beaten out by the other more forceful members, the other unskillful members. But now that you've given them a corner of the mind where they won't budge, they grow stronger. They begin to take over. And when they take over, it's not that they're going to abuse the other side. In fact, as these members of the committee take over, you find that the mind learns that it can live more and more peacefully with itself. Having this cord in the mind helps you step back and see the mind for what it is, see what's going wrong. Without this corner here, you're totally immersed in unskillful states and you can't see a way out at all. But remind yourself, okay, the mind is a committee. Even though unskillful things are coming up in the mind, there is a part of you that's still watching, still mindful, still alert. By standing on the breath, it gives you a perspective. You're not totally in your head. You're also in your body. That takes you out of the back and forth of the thoughts in your mind. And it's because you have this separate perspective. Perspective allows you to train your own mind. As the Buddha said, training the mind is something you have to do for yourself. Other people can't do it for you. They can point out the way, but the actual work is something you have to do. There would seem to be a paradox there if the mind were one solitary unit. It wouldn't be able to teach itself anything new. But the fact that there's so many different voices in the mind, when you learn how to turn that fact to your advantage by strengthening the good voices, not allowing them to get pushed out when unskillful states come in, you find that you can train the mind. In other words, the good committee members start training the, the less skillful ones, the more short-sighted ones, teaching them to look to things in a longer perspective. And it's this way that you can bring the mind to a sense of unity. And all the different factions realize that it's in their best interest to train the mind. They all start working together instead of working at cross purposes. And this is what gives the mind strength. If it decides to work on a project, it will see the project through. If it's pain with Faced with pain and difficulty, all the parts of the mind work together so you don't cause yourself suffering.
So these are some of the advantages that come from training the mind, from staying with the breath. So if you find it difficult to stay with the breath, if you can't quite get get it comfortable yet, at least remind yourself that you're headed in the right direction. You're working on important skills here, even though they may take time. Whatever amount of time that it takes is well invested, well spent. That sense of conviction helps see you through the difficult patches and remind you that they're not always going to be that way. They're just patches. If you stick with the training and develop these qualities in mind, which at the beginning seem to be pretty weak, mindfulness, alertness are awfully ordinary. And they often seem very momentary, but when you get them all working together, you find that they develop strengths that you wouldn't have imagined.